The independent variable, obviously, is the thing that you know, and it's the thing that you can poke a system with and see how that system responds. So that's going to be a sort of a, an overarching theme. Um, to some extent, when you're taking a measurement, you're trying to figure out what its identity is. What is the identity of the thing you're trying to measure? Uh, and what is its value, or, or what properties does it have? So it doesn't necessarily have to come down to a number. It could be a description. Um, but I just thought I'd also start with a statement on science. And I, I don't assert that this is necessarily true. But uh, just as a working hypothesis, Science is an observational technique that has latterly come to be known as a body of knowledge. And I think there's two different things in that. Um, right, so that's just the introductory stuff. Now, it's customary, because I'm a New Zealander, is that the, one of the first things we do when we're addressing an audience is to say something about where you're from. And so I'm from New Zealand. And I put this photo up because it's a, a watercolour by a guy called Augustus Earl. And he arrived on that ship that you can see in the background. And he was a, a well-known watercolourist of the time. We're talking 1827. And that harbour is a place called the Hokianga Harbour. And that's on the west coast of the North Island of New Zealand. And the first mate on that ship was a guy called John Martin. And this is a view of that ship that John was the first mate on uh, from a place called Parkanai, which is a marae on the Hokianga, on the south banks of the Hokianga Harbour. And in that village was a woman called Kiriora. And John and Kiriora met, fell in love, married, and it's one of the reasons why I'm standing before you now. So that tracks me back to 1827. That's when we got underway as a family in New Zealand. Before then, we were Polynesian, and we were English, Welsh, Irish, Anglo-Saxon. So that's my origin story. That's what we would call my whakapapa. You can go further on, and it, you, know what, you know what family trees are like. There's no need to go too far into that. But this is my next um, kind of, is a, this, is, this is a linking slide between origin uh, and kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, as many of you will recognize, these are, are, are valves, and they're often used for amplification, or they can be used as diodes and uh, control of high voltages. Um, my dad was a big um, radio guy. So when he was young, he used to make radios out of anything. But he was big into his valve radios. And so this is the color of my childhood. And we used to listen to the BBC News on shortwave at 6 o'clock in the morning uh, to the smell of frying bacon. And, um, uh, but the other thing about valves, and this is where the link is, is that valves are a stimulated system wherein you can put a small signal across a grid and you can amplify it. And so to some extent, it's a, it's a, it's a nice analog way of coming to grips with the fabric of reality. And you know, there's electrons flowing through that and you've got um, permissible um, things that are, well, that, that are permitted by the, the, the grid that you have inside, which is what your signal's played across. And that's how you can amplify something which is very, very small, and put it out a speaker, or measure it, look at it on an oscilloscope, um, those sorts of things. So valves, very much a part of my background, and also um, kind of nicely fit in with taking measurements of very small things. Um, is that working? Cool. OK, so now we get on to the environment. Well, this is the thing that we want to measure. And it's full of energy. And I, I put this up. This is taken in um, uh, the bottom of uh, Sardinia in a place called Cagliari. Uh, and it's um, just clouds forming in the morning over a range of hills. But 
I just want you to sort of look at it and, and think about the energy that you're looking at there and the magnitude of that and the complexity of that and the way that it's swirling and the way that things you know, sort of bubble up and you can see as the, uh, as the sun shifts across and more energy is put into the system, things start to break out. Um, you can see you know, shooting up as high as it can go, finding its maximum buoyancy, overshooting that a little bit and then sinking back. Um, so, as an environmental scientist, which is another hat on that I put, you know, if you ask me, I'd say marine scientist, but actually environmental scientists, it's all the same thing because the environment doesn't begin and end at the high tide mark. Um, these are the sorts of challenges. How do we measure this stuff? Uh, how do we quantify it and how do we make sense of it um, from what is, you know, to some extent, apparently a chaotic, although when you stand back a little bit further, there's structure in there. Um, but yeah, anyway, I quite like that. The, but the, the um, environment is uh, chaotic, full of energy, things are getting passed around. Um, you know, people will know that I've been banging on them about um, energy through ecosystems. I think that's still relevant. This is part of it. And even when it all looks very calm and still, there's still a lot of stuff going on. And so, you know, this is, there's no waves here, there's no high energy stuff, yet we're putting out um, monitoring arrays that can measure the pulse of an Atlantic current coming into the Arctic and then circulating around the um, Arctic basin. In this case, it's sort of going around the uh, Siberian, the Eurasian um, shelf. And we measure um, warm water coming in from the Atlantic, and that's the sort of the darker stuff and the pink stuff. That's a, a pulse of Atlantic water uh, circulating around through the Siberian islands, more or less. Um, but you can see the interesting thing about that is even though it's, it's warm, it's still dense enough to sink uh, because it's, um, it's a higher salinity than the overlying uh, cold water, which is much, much colder than it. Um, it's a it's a warm pulse of water. Oh, okay. So why do we want to measure anything? What would we want to do that for? It's kind of fundamental to science. Um, I may or may not. I think I might pass over it actually. But I did have a, a nice clip of uh, Richard Feynman, where he's explaining uh, what the basis of science is, and he says the first step is to guess something, have a look at the system, come to understand it as much as you can, and then have a guess. And then from that guess, you've got to compute the consequences of that guess. And, uh, and then you submit those computed consequences to observation. And so that's one of the reasons people like me go out and measure things. And so we might want to know how many of something is. Um, what we were doing this morning, Satara, we were going to um, see how many mollusks we could find in the sand? Not very many, I think, is the answer, <laughs> but some. Uh, and, um, you know, or we, we might be establishing a baseline against which we can compare and look for change. Um, without establishing a baseline, it, everything's relative. You can imagine it's like lifting the earth on a circuit and it floats. Um, or to characterize a response, and this is where the independent variable comes in, you give your system a poke, what comes out the other side? What can you stimulate in it? Um, so I'm going to get to some uh, perhaps more esoteric uh, ways of interrogating nature. Um, and I'm going to mention one name now, and we'll get to him a little bit later, but that name is Judea Paul, or Pearl, sorry, um, that you, who you may, have, may not have heard of, but effectively the, the father of machine learning. And... Um, uh, moving towards artificially intelligent things, but he's also um, uh, came up with a thing with uh, which are Bayesian diagrams and ways of looking at, we'll, we'll get to this a little bit later, but ways of looking at um, correlation and through, um, uh, what's the word, conditional probabilities, trying to extract some kind of causal information out of those with causal diagrams. Oh, I did. Okay, well, we'll let, see if that works. No. Did I go fear on that? Okay. Yeah, no, we'll move along. We'll do that. Okay, right. 
so now we're going to go hardcore measurement theory. Um, even simple measurements come with uh, little hooks that make them non-trivial. Uh, and just taking an example, uh, we're going to look at the measurement of temperature in a fluid, which you know, might, might seem fairly straightforward. However, there's an equation for you. I, I make no apology for that. Uh, that equation, I better look at it here, uh, effectively tells you that when you measure something, there's a time constant before the uh, probe that you put in, whether it's a thermocouple or a thermistor or a, or a thermometer, a mercury thermometer or whatever, there's a certain period of time before it equilibrates with its environment. There's a, an exchange. And so what this equation is telling you is that there's a time constant there's the derivative with respect to time of the, of the measurement temperature that you're seeing on your, on your screen. Uh, there's the measurement that you've got, and that equals what the actual temperature is. Because that's the thing, is that as you go out and make a measurement, you come away with a number, but the reality may be slightly different, and you're going to need to process that and, and, and think about it and, and, and think about where you are with respect to the the curve, if you like. So this time constant, it's got a, it's got a definition. It's 63% uh, of the signal amplitude uh, after a certain amount of time. But the other thing is, is that you're playing with a flow um, term as well. So if I, had a, if I had a laser pointer, I'd be, I'd be doing that now, trying to show you the shape of that curve, which is a characteristic curve. And what it tells you is that if your fluid isn't moving past your sensor, that its response time is much slower than if the fluid is moving past your sensor. Now, you might go, well, that's obvious, and it is. But that has implications when you're using this measurement in conjunction with other measurements to come up with a derived variable such as salinity. So like salinity, standard measurement in oceanography. It's used to get back to the density and um, what people often miss is that even though we've got really, really fast thermistors now in, in the instruments that we put over the side, you know, with, um, with time constants, 60 milliseconds, that kind of thing, is that your package as it moves down, if you're profiling through the water column, is sitting on a boat and that boat is bouncing up and down. So you might be lowering your instrument package at one meter per second, 60 meters per minute, the normal sort of rate. But if your ship's going up and down by two meters, which is not unheard of, then your package is actually doing this all the way down. And as it's doing that all the way down, it's doing a kind of a sinusoidal movement. And the velocity, therefore, past your temperature sensors in an unpumped system is stopping, increasing in speed, stop, slowing down, stopping, increasing in speed, slowing down, stopping. And so you're basically going backwards and forwards. This is why I would be waving my hand if I had a laser pointer. You're going backwards and forwards up that, the first sort of left-hand side of that graph. And that has implications for what you might state as the temperature to be associated with a pressure measurement, to be associated with a conductivity measurement in order to derive the salinity. Are you all with me so far? Sweet. Okay, so let's look at the implications for your temperature record. Your temperature response to a step change is going to be immediate, like it's going to instantly want to go to the new um, output, but it might be incomplete over several time periods over which you're sampling. In changeable conditions, that sensor may not equil equilibrate before it has to go and measure something else. So you're moving down through the water column or there's water flowing past if you're in a river or something like that. It may never actually tell you what the right temperature is or what the actual temperature is because uh, the, the change in conditions are, are happening at a too high a rate. 
the rate at which it wants to get to the new measurement is proportional to the distance between the two. So the greater the, greater the um, magnitude of difference, the faster it wants to get there. Uh, and you can kind of extrapolate that, but as it gets closer, it, it tends to slow down in its response. And this is the real kicker. This is um, the thing where, which says the periodic signals with a repetition rate which is shorter than the time constant are going to be attenuated. So if you're looking at any sort of amplitude signals and they're happening faster than your time constant, then they will be attenuated in proportion to their frequency. So that's uh, measurement theory 101. Um, now, making sense of models. This is kind of coming back to uh, Judea Pearl. I just wanted to run this by you because it's got a um, uh, an ecosystem services diagram, uh, and I sort of wanted to make a link between the, the conversations we've been having about ecosystem services uh, and measurement and causality. Um, as may have been drummed into some of you who have come through a, from a science background, correlation is not causation. And to a large extent that is true, but there is such a thing as covariance, and if there's covariance, then the question can legitimately be asked, why are things covariant? Uh, you know, is it spurious, or is it a real thing? Um, and so you can construct these diagrams and assign conditional probabilities to the different pathways um, that seek to sort of uh, describe what the likelihood of certain outcomes are. Uh, and this is what can be called um, causal diagrams. Um, and so the other thing, and this is, this is where Judea Pell kind of had a moment of inspiration, um, is that he came up with this concept of the counterfactual. And the counterfactual fits nicely into causal diagrams. And effectively, maybe the best way to describe a counterfactual is it's a, you, you say, okay, so I've, I've got this system and I've understood it and, and I have certain possibilities. If, if the thing that I'm interested in didn't happen, what would be the consequences of that? So to some extent, it's like turning on it. If I can take it out, if I've got two conflicting possibilities, for instance, can I remove that logical clash? Now, I don't, I've, I've read the book, it's called The Book of Why by Judea Pearl. I recommend it to all of you. I've read it twice and I wouldn't begin to say that I understood it yet. I might have to get back into it again. But I think that is, um, offers some interesting stuff in terms of um, making sense of measurements and because often, you know, uh, observations are uh, just a, a time series of, of correlations. If you can see what I mean. You get very difficult often to find the mechanism which connects them all. Now, uh, I did want to give you just a bit of an insight into some of the um, stuff that I've been doing with um, the speed of sound, and, and the link is that I, I use it to um, measure things. And the other link is, is that I don't want to know what it means yet. Um, but I went on an expedition um, back in 2018. It was called Fridge. It was a, um, a tiki tour down the hydrothermal vent sites of the, um, the North Atlantic. We ended up in Guadalupe. We left from Southampton. Uh, and I had a chat with the, the PI and said, can I strap a sound velocity probe to the CDD? And over here, nicely labeled, there's a CDD. Now, a CDD is conductivity, temperature, and depth. Uh, there's a whole lot of other instruments on it. There's a 24, uh, 10, or 20 liter bottle strapped to the outside of it. And so that's how big it is. And you'll see that there's two there. And um, the reason for that is that this was also part of the geotraces program. So there were a lot of chemical um, measurements being taken, which was really handy for me. Uh, and uh, one of these um, frames is made out of titanium and the other one's made out of stainless steel. And they use the titanium one for uh, metal free sampling 
uh, and the stainless steel one is, is more the workhorse where you just want to know about the physical properties of the water column. Um, so down the Atlantic, multiple hydrothermal vent sites, and we were starting to um, form an impression of some of the from some of the plumes. So they're buoyant plumes coming up out of these um, vent sites. Um, and what we were doing when we got to the vent, we would be doing CDDs all the way down, of course. But when we got to the vent sites, we were doing a thing called a toyo through the through the plume, which is where you move the ship forward at a couple of knots, and then you lower and raise your CDD package over a you know maybe a thousand meter range at depth uh, to try and form a picture. So the sorts of things that you see. If you're looking at the transmittance of light over a, over a path length, uh, what you can see here is the, the dotted lines is the, the track of the Toyo. Um, that uh, thing with, uh, with the red border is the, uh, is the hydrothermal vent plume. It's a buoyant plume. Uh, it's got structure to it. Uh, the source of the plume is around about where that little dot is about the middle, um, between one, one and 1.5 kilometers. Uh, and this is looking at the attenuation of light. Um, so what you're seeing there is evidence of particulates in the water column. Because we're also measuring the salinity, we're deriving the density, and we're looking at the potential density. Potential density is basically what the density would be if you lifted that up, up to the surface. Uh, but basically you're, you're um, forming isolines, and you can see that the density is starting to conform with the shape of the uh, of the transmission losses, the optical transmission losses. Uh, so that's quite a nice fit. If we do it with the with the CTD uh, or with the conductivity sensor, which is giving you salinity, you can see that you get a bit more structure. But you know it's kind of difficult to pull stuff out. But you'll see that there's a um, a density layer. Uh, and you can see that there's sort of uh, lower density um, water getting lifted up, and that's, you know, it's going to sink back down at some point. But if you look at it with uh, sound, and this is um, where I was using the, the sound velocity probe across a 20 centimeter path length, and we're looking for differences in. Um, the speed of sound according to what it should be. And the, the what it should be is a, uh, a reference cast that we did outside of the hydrothermal vent field. Uh, and then that was really just to cor correct for the other things that go into sound speed, which is the, the temperature and the pressure. Um, so over a range or a, a, an anomaly range, and this is, this is meters per second, so minus one to what's that, 0.6. Um, you actually start to form quite a detailed picture just using the sound of what's happening. And the differences there is uh, to do with composition. So each one of these measurement series that we've been looking at uh, have been giving you, the, um, the, you know, the, the density based on the conductivity, um, the calculated density, uh, the potential density, which is derived from the, um, from the CTD. Uh, but this is density related to um, uh, composition, and, uh, and the reason I raise that is that nowadays, since 2010, we've had a new equation of state for um, for seawater, and um, it's based on um, Gibbs energy and stuff that I uh, would defer to my physics colleagues on. But the crucial point is is that salinity now is a thing called absolute salinity. And absolute salinity is everything that's dissolved in the water. And just to give you a really specious example, if I take a liter of water, pure water, I dissolve uh, 35 grams of uh, salt in that water, mix it up, dissolve it all, I will have a PSU, a practical salinity of 35. I can then dissolve 35 grams of sugar in that same volume of water, and if I'm using a conductivity probe, I will notice no difference, even though I've doubled the dissolved mass fraction. 
Sound, on the other hand, is sensitive to everything dissolved in the water. And so we're starting to form the impression that maybe sound is a better way of determining your density and deriving your salinity than conductivity. Um, it's only a small fraction, because most stuff you know, is kind of polar when it dissolves. But um, when it's not, and when there's sugars around, and one of the primary outputs of photosynthesis is sugars, um, then you know, you're going to start to get anomalies. And it's corrected by um, silicate measurements, but uh, at the same time, that's just an interim measure. I think we can access it through the speed of sound. Um, However, there are kickers in that um, because there's non-unique solutions. Different combinations of salt will have, um, I mean, I don't want to go too much into the nature of water when you dissolve anything into it, but basically becomes a non-Newtonian uh, fluid. And that means that it stiffens at certain frequencies. So you might be able to get it um, with a broadband signal rather than a signal um, just made up of one frequency. But um, so that's, you know, when you go to sea and you want to do some measurements, that's just, those are the sorts of things that you walk away with. Um, and you're starting to map features uh, of the water column as they, um, as they evolve in real time. Uh, and by contrast to what Luis was saying last night uh, and from discussions that I've been having with him, uh, because he uses acoustics also to do, you know, sub-bottom profiling and looking at the geology under the seabed, um, and we decided that what he was doing was seismic oceanography, and in terms of the sound speed stuff, um, what we're doing there is acoustic oceanography, and that's kind of the difference between it. Um, I think we've covered that. We've talked about TOS 10, um, traditional methods, sound speed. Yep, it's very good. So what we're looking for now is um, patterns that present themselves through the pairing of chemical and sound speed. So that was a nice thing about the fact that this was a geotracers cruise because the chemists were on board and they've provided me with a vast data set to start to look for patterns and correlations. And then I might appeal to Judea Pearl to help me out and see if we can find some kind of causal link between the sound speed and different combinations of dissolved minerals. But as those hydrothermal vent plumes advect away from their source, they're precipitating out, they're um, changing their chemistry as they move away uh, quite rapidly. Stuff is falling out really rapidly and, um, and other stuff remains in solution. Um, so let's just sort of sum up a little bit. Uh, even simple measurements, you have to be careful how you do them and that there's lots of stuff that you need to be able to control. Um, when they contribute to a, a derived variable, things become even more important that you need to be on top of, of that so that you've got an actual measurement you can hang your hat on. And so you need to be aware of all the things that affect uh, the way you measure and uh, you know, any effect that, ha that has on the physical property that you're trying to determine. Uh, and I think the last thing I'd like to say is almost anything can be a sensor. Uh, even you can be a sensor. And um, Thule, we were talking about that a little bit. I don't know where you are. Are you here, Thule? Never mind. We were talking about uh, the interaction of the, um, the estuary and the water in the estuary and the water in our bodies. And, you know, how do they, how do they equilibrate if you're in the presence of that over any period of time? Um, so was sprung out of that question that I said if everybody did, you want to measure anything, and the best we um, thought was um, we could maybe look for the return of blood to the surface of the skin and see whether that is any indication of your hydration state and whether that relates to whether you're on the water or off the water. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I wanted to say. I sort of wanted to just start you thinking about what is a measurement and start to question how a measurement is taken and, and you know what it actually means, what it's telling you. If we go back just just briefly to oh no, maybe we can't. Yes we can. To that. I mean you're looking at different ways, different, there's different stories in each one of those graphs. They're, they're showing you the same feature, 
but they're showing you different parts of that same feature. So, um, yeah, that's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. I think I'm within time. <laughs>